So I'm Elsa. I come from Massey University where I'm doing my PhD. Finishing my PhD right now. And I'm going to talk to you about modeling the influence of human social rules on population genetics. Uh, first of all, just to get rid of it, but uh, a few other regiments, I'm working with Murray Cox and Martin Hazelton from Massey University. And I'm also working with an anthropologist uh, in Singapore, St Steve Lansing. And I have data from Indonesia, uh, collected by the Eichmann Institute, processed in the University of Arizona. So uh, big, uh, big network of collaboration. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about human population genetics, and I assume you don't know much about it. Uh, but basically, we are using genetics to reconstruct history. Uh, looking at genetic pattern of different population, we can tell the story of migration, settlement, admixture, population size, and we can even time them with molecular dating. However, they are all based on basically one framework called the Coalescent Framework, which is really, really simple. Everybody knows the model are kind of wrong, they're kind of working, not all the time. And they have a really strong assumption, which is random mating. It's an assumption that works maybe well for animals. However, in humans, we all know mating is not random. We have social roles. So that's where my work come in. I'm looking at the interaction between mating system and genetic patterns. Um, so every society around the world has rules of marriages, always have. It's kind of... Um, typical of human societies. Uh, they are made of prohibition and prescriptions. Typically, all societies have a taboo about incest. You cannot marry your brother or your father. Still in New Zealand, you cannot marry your uncle, for example. And then there are some prescriptions. You have to marry your cousin, or you have to go to this other village and marry that person. And those are all social roles. So we're going to define marriage custom as a set of Migration plus choice of mates, because very often we have a migration uh, in this. When I say marriage, I just think in terms of reproduction, so what matters at the end is that there's a baby. So that's a bit of a shortcut, but just keep that in mind. And now about the genetics. Well, there's a lot of genetic study, of course, and they have observed some variation between genetics of different population and and their mating system. Typically, if the, there's a high migration scale with uh, women moving from population to population, you'll observe different things than another population. But there's been no model, no quantification of any of it, basically. Um, once again, in terms of genetics, assuming you may not know much, we have four kinds of different DNA. Uh, mitochondrial DNA, it's from our mother, and all of us have one. Uh, X chromosome is Difference in male and female. Autosomes are the ones that are not sexually linked. So that's a big bunch of our DNA. And then we have the Y chromosome, only transmitted from father to son. So they're going to tell different stories about what our lineages are. And we, can, we will be able to use those different data and what they tell us to reconstruct social roles. So first of all, there's this question, why did mating system emerge? in all human studies. Um, that's been studied by anthropologists and sociologists. Um, forces could be economical, social, those have been modeled. Could be biological, you don't want to keep on marrying your brother uh, because there's an embryonic effect and you're gonna have genetic defect. But there's no real penalty on that. We don't really know how it works. So are the mating system driving the genetic change? Can we model it? And are the changes making a biological forces that may influence the emergence of mating system. So for the first time, kind of, we're gonna quantify the complex interaction between marriage rules and genetics. Uh, so it's a complex system, as you must be aware. And so I took a simulation approach. I had to code my own simulator because there's a lot of things to program. It's an individual-based model coded in C++ from scratch. Basically, it's really fast, and I can model all my multi-layer complexity from the individual having DNA transmitted from his parents, living in a population, marrying certain time of certain kind of people, migrating, evol evolving through time. So that's quite complex in within. Can also have some demographic effects. It's quite computer demanding, but then I can do all the mating systems I want. Um, 
So in my simulation, once again, my marriage question is going to be a migration plus a choice of mates. I'm going to impose on my individuals. I have independent sub-communities with migration rights. And I do, for it, from one generation to the next, I do one migration per individual or no migration. Um, I do my mating only within my community, so if I move somewhere else, I'm going to marry there. I have a polygyny, meaning the male have several female. That corresponds to the population I'm studying and what their past social rules were like. Um, and then I have sibling avoidance because that's true for most human population. And I'm going to look at a very specific and interesting mating system called asymmetric prescriptive alliance. Uh, it's been found in historical population in all those red dots. So you can see it's all over the world except Europe. And it's kind of an anthropological mystery because this system tells you you have to marry your mother's brother or daughter. And you have to move to a specific village, which is a very strange pattern, right? It's always the mother's brother's daughter, which is only one of the four cousins you can have. And you have a weird, yeah, this migration pattern. And no one really knows why they emerged, and specifically why they emerged in so many populations. Um, so it's made of a migration system, which is a wife giver, wife taker. So if you have five populations here, you give your female, your woman, to another village, and you take your women from a, a different village. So you don't take and give to the same village, which is, once again, quite strange. And within that, you're going to look for your mother's, mother's brother's daughter. If you do that every generation, this migration, your cousin is going to end up being always in the population where you move to. And the way I model it is that I'm going to force people to do that, the female to move and try to marry their cousin. But because it's not very clear in the literature how stringent it is, I'm going to have two relationship parameters, p and p -mate. If they are zero, everybody must follow the rule as much as they can. Meaning if you don't have a cousin, you can't marry it. But if you have a cousin, you have to marry it. But if this is one, so p -mate is one, I'm only doing the wife givers, wife takers. Everybody is relaxed in terms of who you should marry. And same for the migration, in which case, if you, if you marry, if you migrate wherever you want, you mate with whoever you want, it's a random system with female migration. And I'm going to have a continuum of value here. And first, I look at what's the influence. Is there an effect of the mating system on my genetics? Uh, I have my four kinds of DNA, the Y chromosome, the X chromosome, allosomes, mito. First of all, you see the Y chromosome here. I vary my two parameters, the relaxation parameter. There is no difference all across it because we don't affect anything in the male lineage. The, the male always stay in the village in all my kind of model. That's what we expect. Where we see the biggest difference is in the mitral control DNA. So that's the one transmitted from mother to children. And basically, when the system is the most stringent, the lower diversity in mitral control DNA. While when the system is the more relaxed here, we have a higher diversity in genetic. And that's definitely observable. And here we see the same kind of a pattern at the much lower scale. So then I do a study case on the population. Yes, so the migration is definitely influencing much more than the mating. Um, so those two plots you don't see much because they are all on the same scale. This one I kind of zoomed in on different scale. And you can still see that there's a correlation, but this one is not very influential compared to that one. Also, if you migrate to the wrong population, there's no cousin. So the rule about marrying your cousin is kind of obsolete. So then I study Rindi. Rindi is a population in Indonesia here on Sumba, which is in the middle. And it's famous for, for having an APA mating in its history. We have the genetics, and we're going to use the genetics as a front print of the past structure. And we want to see, can we reconstruct? the past marriage from the DNA. We saw there's an effect that seems significant. And we have data, genetic data, for all kind of chromosome. 
can we see uh, in this DNA and reconstruct what was a, the mating system? Uh, so that's what my data looks like. I have 28 men because they present all kinds of DNA. Uh, I have, for mitochondrial DNA, I have sequences, which means I have a set of uh, bases ACTG. That's the base data we can have for 28 individuals. For the rest of the DNA, four samples failed. So I only have 24. And I have something called SNP chips. Basically, for a, a site, you're going to see whether you're a mutant or not. And you're going to have a huge chip, with, uh, which is an array of the SNP. And you're going to have a binary data, are you a mutant or not, for each individual, for each site. So you have, typically for the autosomes, 600,000 sites. So that's huge data, as you can imagine. And within this data, we have, we have signal. That's the number of sites that show polymorphism. So at least one individual is different from the other on this site. That's for the autosomes. If you only look at one chromosome, we still have quite a lot of data. The X chromosome, same. The Y chromosome, you can see we don't have much data. So unfortunately, we're going to have to kind of drop the Y chromosome because the data is not good enough. And that's our mitochondrial DNA sequence. To do my inference of my population uh, mating system uh, for my simulations, I'm using an approximate Bayesian computations framework. Uh, it's a, I can answer questions about it. It's a bit complex of a complex Bayesian framework, but basically simulation-based inference without likelihood, which makes it quite nice for this problem. It's often applied in population genetics, and I can infer either parameter or model choice, or both. In this case, I'm going to do an inference on parameters to estimate my best uh, mating system, and I'm using a rejection algorithm. The way it works basically is that I do a, a ton of simulations, and I choose my simulations, which are the closest to my observations. And I do it first using all my kind of data and inferring three parameters, population size, which um, modifies a lot of the genetic diversity, and my two parameters, PMIG and PMATE, which are the way that I model my mating system. And if I do it blindly, I have a big inference of my population size, since I can infer it, and two big blobs on my other parameters, which mean, doesn't seem like I can infer any of it. But then I looked into details. That's a typical plot where I have, so that's just per population size. My diversity, in black, it's all the simulations. In red, it's the observations. And in green, it's the one that have been, the simulations that have been selected in my ABC model. And you see, well, first, my simulations are within my observations, so I must simulate something right. But the selected simulations don't seem very close to reality. But I actually look at much more than just this diversity on mitochondrial DNA. And if you look at all of what I observe and what I simulate, all of that is wrong. I simulate something which is really far from my observation. And that comes from a problem of data, which is the ascertainment bias problem. It's a very it's a famous problem in population genetics without simple solutions. So what happened is in my sleep trip I was talking about where you look at whether you are a mutant or not. They are chosen for medical purpose, and they want to find sites with mutation. So you're going to have a lot of sites that mutate much more than any site on your DNA. Basically, we don't sequence where there's no mutation, and we know a priori where there's going to be mutation. So what I simulate in terms of just sequences that mutate doesn't match that. And the problem is that because those SNP chips are made by companies with copyrights, we don't know how they are made, and they will not tell us and those SNP chips change all the time as well. So there's no way to correct for it, there's no way to simulate it. Um, so we tried a few corrections. Uh, basically, we had to look at a ratio of diversity between two, the autosome and the X chromosome with both had bias, or the difference in diversity. And basically, so that's our inferred uh, posterior density for each parameter. We still kind of have the population size. We have a small idea of the PMIG, which is, seems not to be zero. But then the, we can't really infer the, 
migration parameter. And we can do a cross validation of our, of our ABC. So typically that's our estimated value and that's our true value for the mailing parameter. Doesn't really work. We don't estimate anything near the true value. For the um, migration, we are much a bit better. It's not perfect, but we kind of have a, a signal. And same for the population size. But it's, it's really not great. So the question is, did we lose the signal just because of this acetone bias? Is there a signal at all? Uh, we can do a correlation of our three inferred parameters and observations. And there's high enough correlations that we should be able to infer those from the observation if we had the right data. Uh, once again, we did the simulations without the observation. If we had the perfect data, could we infer anything? So that's our cross-validation, which looks much better in terms of population size and p-migration. Doesn't seem like the p-migration mating, sorry, we have much signal at all. And indeed, if you look here, that's why we don't have much correlation. So as a conclusion, we, we can first observe and quantify this the, the effect of the mailing system. And that's a framework for people who want to study more population or what's, what's this uh, genetic effect of my mating system? Can I correct my current uh, genetic model from that? Um, in terms of inferring the, the mating system from genetics, the data we have is not good enough and we can't correct for it for now. But um, we can do full genome sequences soon poor in a couple of years, five years top, that will become really cheap. And it seems that with a full genome sequence, which is what we simulate, we will be able to do it. So basically the framework is now here, we're just waiting a couple of years for the data. Um, also the real mating system is quite unknown. People have great ideas, the anthropologists fight about it. So that's why we model it with some kind of fluid equation parameter, but that doesn't help with trying to reconstruct because there's so much unknown about it. Uh, we have this complex link in mailing system and population genetics data, which is really interesting and I hope we can get much more out of it. And for yeah, just a bit of time, I'm going to talk about what I'm going to, I'd like to do further from that, because that's a whole new world that can open from the genetics, how we can maybe look into social stuff, mi local migration. Um, because we've been able to do, kind of quantify the penalty of, in terms of biological uh, factor, how much this mating system affects our biology, we should be able to use it in terms of uh, how, how did the mating system emerge, what was the weight of this biological factor, and do more in terms of evolution of mating systems, uh, so we can add the biological cost to the current social and economic network models of how uh, society arise. And we, I'm sure we can get still much more out of the genetics, trying to look at it from a different angle. And just because I'm here, I'm actually looking for a postdoc, so <laughs> feel free to ping me if you can. Thank you. Ah, oh, so that's, that's, that's what I was trying to do with this. And because of my data, it seems we can't infer much. Like our power of estimation is pretty low. But uh, we can see that they don't follow the migration rule much because that's, there's, there's no probability that was there. And if it was there, we should be able to kind of see it. And if they don't migrate according to the scheme, they can't marry who they want because the cousin won't be in the right place. Yes, so we could, we could do dynamic, but that would add much more parameter. And because... Do you think it's possible you could say something about how these things have changed? That, yeah, that's, that would be very interesting. Um, unfortunately, the data is really poor in terms of what people think happened and even what the genetics tells us. 
So for now, we can't really look at it. What we can do is look into simulations, how that would affect differently. And we can look at how, if you shift from mailing system, uh, when do you lose the signal, typically? Um, so you have a mating system, you shift, there's a signal in the genetic, and after a while it's, it's lost. Um, so there, there's a lot of things to look at, yeah. Uh, 